All right, here we go. We're going to start today with any questions that you had from last time. We were talking about developmental psych, and we got to a point right here where we were talking about social development of infants. Um, are there questions from last time? We're talking about the newborn. I showed a couple of video clips about some reflexive actions. What's this reflex, ready? In a newborn, if you touch them right here and gently stroke their cheek, they will turn and start sucking, sucking and we call that the, it's the rooting reflex, okay? Babies, um, gently stroked right here, we'll do that. We talked about the root, oh, it's right there, <laughs> rooting reflex. We talked about way we, the way we, find preferences for mothers, uh, their voices, for example, or their smell, and we can exploit. What are some ways, what are some ways that we can ask a baby what it prefers? How often or how frequently they might suck on a pacifier. That's one great way, so sucking behavior. Give me another one that we explored. Uh, brain activity, we can watch certain activity of the seeing, for, for example, we can take an infant, show it a picture over and over again, and this infant's brain activity can be measured when it sees something new or different. And then anybody else, another technique that we can use, or another infant, let's say, behavioral cue? Uh, what, what is it? Eye. Yeah, eye movement, where they're staring, and another one kind of related to that would be, let's say, boredom. We can watch when children get bored by seeing the same thing over and over again and they show the same things you do, kind of yawning and uh, not really wanting to pay attention. Okay. Now, social development, we ended by talking in here how infants begin to develop these cues or uh, these, these, this repertoire of behavior given some of the environmental cues that they get. And so, for example, in early interchanges that are going on, we find that the baby has a lot of impact on the parents by these kind of very important social things. We talked about language and the beginning development of, of language is kind of this when they begin to show babbling and the parents respond back and forth and it's that give and take and we learn things like how we elevate uh, uh, the pitch of our voice to say we're done talking now or I wanna keep talking and wait, don't interrupt me or okay, now I'm done talking, okay? And so we lower it and then babies start to pick this up very early on, it's part of this social development. We talked some then about social interchanges. Next, early social responses. Um, we're finding babies are very sophisticated when they come out. Um, they obviously don't have all of the same kind of social things that we would have in adults, let's say, but for infants there are clear signs that they're showing very early on. Um, children will begin to show what we call true smiles. Have I talked about that, where infants in here will show a true smile to a mom or to a dad, and by six months, they're beginning to show fake smiles to people that they don't know that smile at them. So if a baby is given, uh, if a stranger sees a baby and comes up and smiles, the baby kind of knows, oh, it's time to smile. It, we talked about the impact of mirror neurons. That is, this baby's smile reflex is almost kicked in and they smile, but they're not showing true smiles to strangers all the time. They're kind of showing fake smiles, something we do all the time. But true smiles are found in this certain kind of muscles that get cringly up and, and stimulated up here and, and we can follow and watch these babies and see that's a true smile and they tend to, so those are early social responses. Then, physical contact is a very important social uh, developmental um, influencer. We ask this question, why do babies get attached to a mom or to a dad? And it used to be we believed that a baby was attached to a mom or to a dad because the baby was getting nutrition from them. And so we talked a little bit about this experiment, experiment with Harry Harlow's study in which he tried to find out is it really because a parent provides a baby with nutrition, right? Or is there some other dynamic that's causing this bonding between parent and child? And Harlow found what? Summarize it real quickly. Found that 
it was much more likely to find bonding with social contact, I'm sorry, with physical touch as a huge variable in having, helping babies attach to a parent. So that physical contact that we provide has something to do with these children now being connected to us. So let me show you real quickly what a, um, this study was like. By the way, he found out when uh, Harlow did these studies, they weren't sure how powerful this was until they began to look at um, other ways that babies would show this kind of connection. And so he did a study where he scared them, for example. Let's see if this works. Okay, let's wait. Turn this on. Uh, audio mute. Let's try it again. It's not playing. Let's see. Well, here's what he's doing. We'll try it one more time. Um, what he's doing is he's expo he, these, these little baby monkeys will uh, be scared eventually, and the goal is to see where do they turn to. Um, let's see if I can get this audio to work. One more time. Right here. And if not, I'll just describe what they found, and you can see it. Um, no. Good try. It was weaned on a wire mother. Here's baby 106. <coughs> Watch. He's going to the wire mother. Stop the little. Okay, let me show you the next one. Can you guys hear that okay? All right. That's kind of a threatening move right there, so you can see how comfortable he is. This gives us part of the picture. Okay. These monkeys were well taken care of. 
other than being scared every once in a while. And the goal was to try and figure out this. Where does this attachment come to? What, 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 what variables are influential? And they couldn't do this with human babies. <laughs> Instead, what they tried to do with Harlow's studies was to show that this kind of attachment comes in fairly early on, and it's related a lot to this notion of touch. Now, one kind of uh, application of this right away was in the area of working with premature infants. Um, one thing that happened was premature infants were um, treated, and, and probably, let's see, how many of you, who is a premature infant? Uh, anybody know? Uh, anybody in here born um, more than three weeks premature or, four, or a month premature? Um, let's see, okay, for some of you that raised your hands, um, how, how many weeks do you know? Five. Five weeks premature, anybody more than that? Yeah? Six? Nine, Nine weeks premature? Okay, let's start with, do you remember how they, do you, have you talked to your parents or do you know how they treated you when you were premature? Did they leave you in an incubator? in an incubator for three months. Uh, do you remember, did they, have you talked or asked what your first couple of weeks were like? Okay, Pro what happened about, about your time of, well about 18 years ago now, there were uh, kind of a big shift, and the shift went like this. Previous, 20, 25 years ago, we treated premature infants this way. We were afraid their hearts uh, lungs, other, other major organs weren't fully developed, and so the best thing you can do is mimic the womb. So you put them in an incubator, you put them in a, it's a kind of a darker room, it's really quiet, and you don't touch them. You kind of let them be because it seemed like if they got overstimulated, and touch would do that, it would kind of overstimulate them, it might put too much pressure, and it might tax their system too much. And then there was a change, and it happened to be with um, a researcher who decided to put it to the test and say, what if we did touch these babies? Is that really a bad thing? And so she was able to get permission to take premature infants and began to do, like take their backs and massage them three or four times a day. And as she did this, she started to find some amazing things. Well, in the end, her study, when, when they did a full study of this, they took premature infants and they did the way they would normally treat them, putting them to a, um, an incubator and keeping stresses down to a minimum and touch down to a minim minimum and then you took another group of prematures and they gave them uh, they, they would rub their backs three or four times a day and massage them and these babies developed quicker in fact were released out of ICU on average one week earlier than these babies and it had a lot to do with this power of touch. And ultimately, it started to change the way premature infants were treated because this is a very big thing. So touch, one of the kind of the payoffs of doing studies like this related to, for example, Harlow's studies was how big of a sense this is, uh, how important it is to development. And so that was one great um, change, and it's now you'll find more and more hospitals have adopted this uh, with premature infants. Okay, after infancy, and or a as we move into childhood and infancy, we have now uh, another way of looking at babies and children that is of interest to psychologists, and that's in what's called their intellectual development. Intellectual development um, with infants is something we're gonna spend some time talking about today. Um, the brain is producing uh, neurons during this stage um, in, in some amazing speed. A half a million a minute may actually, uh, neurons may be being produced um, during early stages uh, of infancy. And they're making huge numbers of what we call networkings or connections between nerve cells. And these neural networks are forming at such a rate. Now, by the way, we, we, we take and prune these throughout life, our brain seems to uh, use, those that get used more frequently uh, are, are maintained, and those that are not, those synaptics uh, that aren't being uh, utilized will get pruned. So this is a very powerful time, and so we're, now we're looking at infants when it comes to their growth and intellectual development um, as a very important time of setting some things. Here's um, what 
Uh, anybody have a name of somebody that comes to mind, a psychologist that is associated with the area of intellect, or the study of the intellectual development or the cognitive development of infants and children? Any name come to mind? Okay, Freud was very big in one area. He would study some things related to children, especially in, in, in the areas of uh, psychodynamic approaches and therapy, but how about... Uh, all right, uh, yeah, Piaget, Piaget, uh, same thing, yeah, it's a, that's exactly who it was. And he, Sean Piaget, uh, was probably the one, the pioneer in studying babies and infants and their intellectual development and growth. So we're going to talk about him today. And Piaget has a, a very interesting uh, background, um, his Research was in a different field originally. Um, he was published by the time he was 16 in a scientific journal. I think he was studying mollusks and other shelled sea creatures and eventually was fascinated as he began to explore um, something related, that is primarily related to the cognitive development of children. He began to find, as he worked in an area uh, in assessing IQs with soldiers and others. They started assessing families, but he started to notice that children intellectually would begin to make some weird, odd errors. And so this is, Piaget's work um, was primarily about the idea of how we acquire knowledge. And this study for him led him into some areas related to the errors that children would be making um, and these errors in thinking and knowing were fairly consistent. He found them a lot in the kids that he interviewed. And so Piaget began this movement of studying cognition, ways of thinking and knowing, and focused on these biases that children had, which at the time, people used to believe that you were fully developed, at least cognitively, by seven or eight. There's not much more that occurs. Um, they, kids had brains and minds very similar to adults until he started to find out. They made some very important uh, errors which pointed back to some huge differences between adult brains and children's brains. So, he began to study something called schemas, for example. Um, a schema is a cognitive structure or a template that we all use at times um, to, for example, navigate through the world or to understand things. And Piaget began to study how children use schemas to help them understand the world. So um, a baby might have a schema initially about how a parent responds, and you can see an infant do this, for example. If you've ever seen a baby play with a toy, they develop a schema related to an interaction with the parent, and they'll do this. They'll play with something, and you'll see them bang it, and then oftentimes a kid will throw it or drop it on the floor. What happens next? <coughs> well, what usually happens next is the parent sees this, they look down, the parent sees this event, pick it up, give the toy back, and the kid goes, huh? And they play with it, and then they throw it back on the floor. And then the parent comes over, picks it up. Well, pretty soon this becomes a cool game, doesn't it? Like, oh, I'll just throw that. And I'll watch this kid, person, mom, dad, whoever, go and pick this up. Well, this schema is now developing. They're developing this template that says, oh, there's a, a response. There's this, I do this, this happens. And they begin to realize lots of things this way. Um, we, we, you know, you have other schemas that can be related to how... For example, uh, how to use a straw. And so uh, you'll see babies that you can give them a straw and there's liquid in there and they finally go and they start to suck on it and they realize, oh, this, uh, something shaped like that, you put it in your mouth and eventually you get something good out of it and then they begin to, to learn that schema and so they might, you might give them anything like a toothpick and they might go like that, start sucking out of it. And so it's the schema that they now use to approach life. Okay. What Piaget did was he found out that there's different styles or different ways of using schemas that go about changing. So I'm going to ask you to read about assimilation and accommodation. It's just two specific ways that these schemas can change. If you give a baby, for example, that knows how to use a straw, uh, we gave our son when he was little a French fry and he went like this. 
took this French fry and just sucked the whole insides out. <laughs> because he had the schema of using a straw and went like that for like an hour. Now that is assimilating, taking what you know about the world, and as you know about the world, you then, let's turn this down, you then apply that, okay? Or you can accommodate, completely change the schema and do something else. And so look at assimilation and accommodation in your textbook and you'll find some other good definitions of it. It was just Piaget's attempt to explain some different cognitive development things. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about some stages. I'm gonna put them up here um, on the PowerPoint, but these stages are listed in your textbook, and so you don't need to write them all down. Instead, what I'd like you to do is look at them. There are, uh, this is Piaget's uh, kind of attempt at saying that we all go through these kind of different developmental stages, the first occurring right after birth, all the way up until about the age of two, something called a sensory motor stage, where a baby is most likely to experience the world through putting things where? Almost anything, let's say a baby that they learn to grasp, where does, that, where does that thing go that they're holding on to? Right into their mouth, for example. And so a lot of times parents just go, oh, good night, you gotta watch everything because it will go into their mouth because that's how they're experiencing the world through this kind of thing. And sometimes you think, I don't want to know what they're chewing. <laughs> And oftentimes, what you'll find is that babies are learning now, okay, I, I do this, this tastes this way, this feels this way, this does this, and it, Piaget just said, children go through what's called this sensory motor stage. By the way, this stage has some cool things to it. Um, there are, I'm not, I'm not even sure if this is gonna play, but we're gonna try a video real fast, of different stages that kids go through in different ways of finding out, but, one of the things that occurs during the sensory motor stage is um, something called object permanence. Y'all ever heard of object permanence when babies begin to learn that the world or the objects in the world continue to exist even if they're not there? And so a baby will be playing with a toy. You can do this. How many have, uh, if, you, if you ever have access to a child that's under the age of one and they're playing with something, what would they do, let's say at six months, if you took this toy and, and they're playing with it, you set it in front of them and you covered it up with a blanket? What would they do at that point? Let's try a baby. Anybody, have, anybody uh, seen a four or five month old baby recently? What would they do if we took that four or five month old baby and put that toy underneath the, the blanket? They might cry would they begin to look for the toy? Well, here's what's interesting. Around four and a half, five, they are probably just developing what's called object permanence. And that means that objects that are hidden, if you develop per object permanence, that they continue to exist even when they're hidden. Does that make sense? Before then, if an object disappears, they would, uh, uh, probably a four month old, if you covered it up, would stop even looking for it. Because it would be like, oh, well, that's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Five, six months, you cover it up and they're like, well, that's too bad. But if something interesting happens around that time where they begin to go around six months and possibly earlier, but they begin to start going, oh, there's an object, it, it exists, and they will lift up the, let's say, the little blanket and go, oh, there's the toy. Now you know they're beginning to develop this concept called object permanence. Now we test that to find out cognitively when do they pick this up and what implications does it have. And so that's object permanence. Let me show you a little video that might or might not play. I have a feeling it's not going to, but we will try. Let's see. Ah, oh, the sound. Um, well, I'll just describe a little bit about it. This, this right here. This baby, at about four months, has an interesting feature going on. Um, if you hold a baby at around this age, four or five months up uh, to a mirror, and if you put something on their nose, let's say like a piece of red, let's say lipstick uh, on their nose, and you hold a six month old in front of a mirror, what will that baby do? The baby will just look at that mirror and go, wow, there's another baby there, <laughs> all right? Something interesting happens at around one year to up, in between the ages of a year to a year and a half. You put a baby around a year and a half up there with something on its nose and almost always does what? Yeah, it looks at the mirror and goes, 
oh, that's me. That's on my nose. Now, why is that significant? Well, the significance to that is this baby is now identifying that that person in the mirror is, a, is me. That's a huge developmental step. So you'll see this baby just smiling. I don't know if you can see the red on there, but this baby doesn't have any idea that that person in the mirror is it. <laughs> Okay, this is called the rouge test. It's just a really quick way, so now the baby doesn't know. You put a little bit of red rouge on its nose, put it up there, and the baby mostly just stares again. <laughs> it's just happy to see another baby, okay? Now, same with this baby, all right? About seven, eight months, same thing. They just sit, now she's right around seven, 16 months, and watch what she does. She reaches up and says, wait, that's me. Now, that's an amazing milestone right there. That provides something very important for researchers to begin to look at. When do humans develop the awareness of self? That this is me, I exist. By the way, Anybody know of any other animals that if we were able to do something similar, they would know that it's them and not just another animal? Pigs. Elephants have uh, probably the ability to do this. Um, uh, they have a, 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 a sense of self that it, it's, it's close. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure if elephants can do that or not. Go ahead. Yeah, dolphins have a sense of self-awareness. You have uh, any of the major, like orangutans, uh, chimpanzees, uh, all will do this. They'll begin to touch, and they know that that object in the mirror is themselves. Now, in animals like this, um, what happens is they begin to, to um, show this kind of sense that they, that, that they exist, or there's at least a, a rudimentary awareness for children, it also means that they begin to develop around that time a moral sense, a sense of things like right and wrong. And it's tied into this, um, at the same time they're beginning to develop this sense of self, they're beginning to have this basis of knowledge or a moral sense. Things are good, things are broken. If you have a little kid who's 18 months and you, you'll start to hear this all of the time, one of their favorite phrases is, uh-oh, like that. And that means, oh, that's not really good. <laughs> when you hear, uh-oh, it usually means like the toilet's really bad and overflowing everywhere. And the kid goes, well, what'd you do? Well, my toy. Like, oh, yeah, that is an uh-oh. And they go, or they'll bring in like a doll without a head and they'll go like this, uh-oh. <laughs> somebody bad did this and that means they know well see that's a funny thing to go uh-oh it means there's a right and this is wrong that's a moral sense that develops uh, during this stage of sensory motor um, during um, this let's see if this one plays up yeah let's try it here's this object permanence and you can watch no maybe this doesn't have any sound She's pretty much unable to know that it's there, so she just, she just leaves. So that makes sense. Before object permanence, that's the idea. Okay, well, that wasn't any good at all. And so it's during that stage where they ultimately begin this process. Now, as they progress out of that, as these kinds of sensory motor skills, um, and, and as they move out of this stage, uh, they turn into uh, another stage, Piaget, called this pre-operational stage. A pre-operational stage was one that was strongly related to how they began to use language. They begin to represent words and images. But the problem is they don't always have logic. So we're going to spend some time with some pre-operational kids. Let me just show you one very powerful thing that they're able to do. And we'll try it in here with... Uh, our kids as well that have visited today. But here's one thing called the perspective taking ability of a pre-operational child uh, called theory of mind. So let's see this. It's a great study on when they develop the ability to take perspectives of others. Where it is. 
Okay. Which hand is it in? Yay! Yeah. These children are being shown a simple game of hide the candy. Hi. They all quickly understand the game. Yay! Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Well done! But when it's the children's turn to hide the candy, they divide into two groups. There are those that can do it, the older ones. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I got it. You hide the sweet, so... And those that just can't get it. And I'll try and guess where it is. So you hide it. Oh. Before they are free, these <laughs> children <laughs> suddenly have to imagine what their opponent can or can't see. So they are hoping to be able to see When a baby, you can test, this is a fairly easy test you can, you can do. You can try a three-year-old or a two-year-old and just play that game and just see. And it's a very important stage that occurs during this pre-operational where we call it theory of mind. They begin to go, oh, somebody else has a thought that they're thinking this and I, they now can know what that person's thinking. And so they, if I show you this, for example, that person will know where the candy is, but if I do this, and so it happens at around, around three and a half or four. Now, that's called a theory of mind. I'll show you an example in that uh, today here in just a minute. The, I'll show you also this thing of conservation and it also occurs uh, during pre-operational. Let me just show you how this would work. You've probably seen this before. It's a fairly common, well, well done study that's been repeated a lot of times, but this is a theory of conservation that shows, in fact, I'll do it in here with, with some kids uh, real fast. So, um, let's try, and I'll put the camera on, and we'll have some uh, kids come up real fast. Let's see if we can do this. All right. Hopefully you guys will be able to see this up here. Um, are there any chairs? Do you think you could, somebody could bring that bench over to me? I, I, maybe two people. Just we're going to set it up here and put the kids on it. I think they'll be. That might be too high. That might work. <laughs> Making you carry that. Thanks for doing that. Okay. Oh, that'll be perfect. It's a little wobbly though. <laughs> No, it's actually very safe. <laughs> hmm. Okay, um, and we'll try a microphone. So we have, uh, we have, let's see if I can remember. I know we have Andrew here today. Uh, let's see if I remember other names. Bella, Andrew, Bella, and? Ashley. Ashley. No. Kathy. Kathy. <laughs> okay. Let's try. Bell, you want to come on up for a minute? You want to come try something? Andrew, come, you can bring him up over here. Come on, Andrew. Come on, kid. You guys can come on up. How you doing, kid? You get to sit right there. Oh. Okay, let's try this. Zoom out. Yes. How you doing today, kid? I'm good. Whoa. Thank you. Can you hold that for just a sec? Have you ever talked into one of those? Say hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I love this class. Do you love this class? Is, is, do you have any favorite teachers? Or did you go to school? Well, I don't go to school. You don't go to this school? <laughs> All right. OK. I, I, think, I think you're going to do just fine. <laughs> All right. Bella, you want to come sit up? Where's Bella? You want to come up in a minute? 
No, maybe later. You, come, you think about it. Kathy, you want to come hang out with me for a minute? Yeah, you can bring up, your sister could come with you. No, not yet. Maybe eventually they can. They don't have to. You guys can sit there and watch for right now. Okay. Andrew. Junior officer, where'd you get this thing? What is that? I got it from a police officer. A police officer? Did you, did you get arrested? No. Are you in trouble? No. What did he give you that for? Because you're a nice guy or a good kid or what? I'm a good kid. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe that. Okay, we're going to try and play some fun things today. Does that sound really good? Let's do that. All right, so I, I'm going to start with some easy questions. Are you ready to try an easy question? Well, wait, are you in preschool? Do you have a preschool? Do you go to school anywhere? Yeah, at the ones. Where? Not the wrong ones. Oh, the, the wrong ones. Yeah. yeah, some of these students have wrong ones, too. Then. Okay, let's try this. And, and, uh, let me add, this is a very easy question, but are you a boy or a girl? I'm a boy. <laughs> Dang. I knew that. Okay, I need a um, I need an M A L. Do you know how to spell? Nah, don't worry about it. You'll get it eventually. <laughs> if you were in my class, though, I would teach you how to spell. Huh? Okay. Do you know? I need an M A L E. Got it? With L O N G. Got it? H A I R. Raise your hand. An M A L E with. L-O-N-G. Come on, there's got to be. And a little longer. Okay, okay. So, uh, no, you have other things. Facial. Come on, somebody's got to have it. Okay, okay, all right, perfect. All right, Andrew, I got a question for you. And I need a, uh, a G-I-R-L, <laughs> which is the opposite. Okay, right, yeah, yeah, right here. Um, let, let me do, do me a favor. Are you okay with this playing this game, Andrew? I have a question for you. Am I a boy or a girl? You're a boy. Really? How do you know? Because I can tell how I talk. How I talk. A boy. A boy. I do. I have boy talk. Yeah. What? Do, how do girls talk, by the way? Girly talk. <laughs> I know. Girly talk. Yeah, they do girly talk. That is really bad. What's like, what's girly talk? Like, we're giving something, like, what do they do? What do they say for girls? It's kind of weird, huh? Okay, I'll tell you what. You, you kind of know some things, so, okay. This person back there, he's gonna stand, that person that is gonna stand up, where are they? Where is that person? Okay, stand up person. Is that a boy? Or just kind of halfway up, not all the way, right there. Boy or a girl? A boy. How do you know that's a boy? I get that by the hair. <laughs> see, that's why I, as, see, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, how, how about her? Raise your hand, a hand, person. <laughs> how about this person? Boy or girl? Right here, Andrew, boy or girl? How do you know? I just did. You, you just did. What kind? How did you know that was a boy? Because what about his hair? It's just the boy hair. Yeah. Do boys have certain hairs? Yes. And do girls? What do girls have? What is that thing? Yeah, let's set it right here. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll show. Ooh, which hand? Okay, we'll do that in a minute. Um, yeah. Okay, let's try it right now. Theory of mind. Here we go. Ready? Which hand? Is it behind? Oh, you did it! Wait, now you gotta keep, okay, now you do it for me. Which hand? Which hand? <laughs> okay, well you have to bring it out so I can see. Huh? <laughs> oh. Um, I'm not sure, wait, let me see. Let me see. I bet it's, I bet it's that one. Did they get it? Oh! Right. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't do it, huh? That was, it, 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 let's try, maybe it's a littler thing. Oh, no, I can't. Hold on, we don't need to use a potato chip right now. Oh, potato chip. <laughs> okay, that, this is a funny class. You, you, you set that right here. 
All right. Uh, now, so we, by the way, sometimes this gender identity sets in around age four, but if you, if you could find some boys with long hair and they go, oh, that's a girl, or if a girl was to cut her hair very shortly, she could be turned into a boy. Now, by four, <laughs> do you agree with that? You don't even know what I said. By the age of four, uh, this tends to get, gender identity tends to get stuck in there. Let's try another easy question. You ready for an easy one? Yes. All right, let's do this. Close your eyes. Now, let me ask you this question. Keep them closed. Oh, keep them closed. Okay, uh, can I see you? Okay, well, let me ask you this. Can you see me? Keep your eyes, can you see me? Now, can I see you? Wait, okay, close your eyes. Close your eyes one more time. Can you see me? No, you can't see me. Can I see you? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, that you, can I see you? Yes, you can. Yeah. About, about three and a half or four, you'll also find that children will develop this kind of sense uh, that even if I close my eyes around three, they will sometimes say, oh, you can't see me either. My eyes are closed, you can't see me. So what Piaget did, by the way, was begin to look at things called egocentrism, or uh, he would ask certain questions like, um, why certain things happen? Andrew, is it warm outside or cold today? Warm. <laughs> warm. Why is it so warm out there? Do you know why? Because it's summer. Yeah, because it's summer. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, a little kind of an edge there, you know, have you noticed that? Just a little, because it's summer, hello, you know. Do you know, why, why, why is it so warm in the summer? Do you have any idea? Why is it? Because summer is hot days. Yeah, why is it so hot? Because summer's supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Do you love it when it rains? Do you like the rain? Or do you remember what that is? <laughs> yeah, because it just helps flowers grow. That's why it rains, yeah. It really, don't encourage him. Hello. Yeah, so what Piaget would do is he'd begin this process of asking them questions because it flowers grow. Uh, why else do you think it rains? Did you, have you ever been in the snow before? Yeah, do you like the snow? Why do you think it snows? Because it could be hot. You could be really hot, and the snow helps what? Get you cold. It helps get you cold a little bit. There's a, some egocentric kids will say things like this, it snows so I can play in it. That would be egocentrism, this kind of notion that things revolve around you, or it, it's hot because you know, it helps me, or, what, or it rains so I can have puddles to play in. That's an egocentric thought that tends to go away by the time you're 20. <laughs> Not always, but most of the time. Okay, let's try this. We have, I have some really fun questions. Do you have a brother or a sister? A brother. What's your brother's name? Connor. Connor, that's a cool name. Does Connor have a brother? No. <laughs> see, it's again egocentrism, you get it? Do you see that? I mean, that's a fascinating answer. And Piaget went, well, that's a weird thing to say. He doesn't have any brothers? That's weird. No, it's just because they, they don't, car doesn't need, meant them anymore. Because they live in a different state. <laughs> yeah. I, okay, that's right. <laughs> she, he, he, we don't know what you just said. They live in a different state. Oh, what state do you live in? We live in the state I, we already in. Yeah, what is that one? Do you now happen to know what that one's called? I never remember it. That one was called Florida. Oh, Florida. <laughs> I love that state. That's a cool one. It's probably a lot better than... Okay, let's try this one. <laughs> You're, you're, really, you're really fun, and this is cool. Now, let's try one more theory of mind. Ready? I'm going to ask you this question. Um, and uh, would somebody do me a favor? Would you do me a favor and just, yeah, leave the room for a second? Wait, tell me your name. Oh, yeah, Judy, yeah, leave the room. She's going to leave now. And we'll come get her in about two minutes. She's going to stand right there. Oh, Andrew, I've got to ask you this question. What do you think is inside of this can? Potato chips. Oh, potato chips. You're a smart kid. Ready? What's inside of there? It's candy. 
It's candy. That's so <laughs> It's candy. I love this. This is a great game. Okay, we're going to bring Judy in. She doesn't know. All right, okay, Judy, come on in. Okay, Judy, stand over there. We're gonna ask Judy what's inside of here. What do you think she's going to say is in here? What do you think she's gonna say? What is she gonna say? Potato chips. <laughs> you think she's gonna say potato chips? Yeah. Okay, that's a good answer. It means at around four that he, she, he is now developing this theory of mind. Why? Can you think about it for a minute? Why does that assign that he's developed a sense of another, a theory of mind? Because Judy, by all rightful purposes, when I show her this, she should say, what's in here? Potato chips. And he said, Judy's going to say that. What's in here? Chips. Chip. Candy. <laughs> <laughs> See, they go back and forth a lot, too. Sometimes they get... Now, she's going to think there's what in here. What is she going to say? What is she going to say? I know it's candy. You know it's candy. What is she going to say? What is she going to say is in here? Judy, what do you think's in here? Pringles. She, she thought they were potato chips. You got it right, kid. Yeah, okay, you can sit down. Point is this. Did you get it? What they do is she, he now has a good theory of mind that she's going to say this. For three-year-olds, they'll say this. Ooh, she's going to say candy. Because that's what he just experienced. Okay? Does that make sense? It's a cool thing. All right, let's try what's called conservation. This is a good one. All right, now I'm going to put... Who? Do you, do you, this is Coke. Do you like Coke? Do your parents, do you get a drink Coke? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, it's good stuff. Huh? You want, uh, no. Okay. <laughs> now, look at these two things. They're two beakers. And these two beakers have Cokes in them, and I poured the same amount. Ready? So, Andrew, does this one have more, or does this one have more, or are they the same? Well, let's switch them around here, because so, they, We'll try and make them the same. Which one has more, are they? This, that one has more. It's not supposed to. Let me see if I can fix it. Oh, okay. We'll take that off. I'll pour a little bit in here, okay? And that way they'll have the same. Okay, now, do they have the same now? They do have the same. Yes, awesome. Now they have the same. Now, ready? I'm gonna hold this up like this, and they have the same, right? Now watch, I want you to point to the one. They're the same, now watch. Okay, now, which one has more, or are they the same? This one has the most. Really, this one has the most, why is that? Because you tipped it over. <laughs> Hello, because you tipped it over and this one has, if you were really thirsty, which one would you drink? Because if you want a lot of Coke, if you were really, really thirsty and you want a lot, a lot of Coke, which one would you drink? You would drink that one. Yeah, because it has more, huh? Now which one has more, are they the same? <laughs> They're the same probably if you look at them or that one have a little bit more? That one has one. Yeah, a little bit more. Okay. <laughs> that is an example of a theory of conservation. And what did Piaget... <laughs> <laughs> All right, stop it over there, child. <laughs> Did you like these things? You know, I'd let you drink out of them, but I don't know what was in there before. And we'll get you, we'll get you a drink. Are you thirsty? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have anything. Okay, do you understand conservation? A little bit, you can see for you and I, we would go like this, good night. The, even though, in, in, for, for, for Piaget, what he found out for these children is in conservation, two principles are occurring. I'll put this back up in just a minute on your slides, but there are two key variables for Andrew at this stage, what's called centration and irreversibility. Andrew is focusing on the central aspect of this problem. What's the central aspect of this problem? What's, the, what's he focusing in on? He's, he, he's looking at the height of this liquid, right? This one now has more because it's taller. And what, what he's not showing is this thing called irreversibility, this ability to go, oh, you just do this, and they're back to the same, and this, therefore, should also be the same. And so there's two things, a centration issue and an irreversibility issue, and that's how this thing works for um, 
for children of this age. Um, can you see over, oh, I'll tell you what, let's try something over here. Now, um, in the center, hey, look behind you and I'll show you something really cool. See back there, that picture, can you see it all right? Okay, it's kind of uncomfortable, but now watch. Which row has more um, of coins or are they the same? So I'm gonna give you this thing, and well, no, yeah, see, this row, can you see that little red dot up there? Yeah. Which one has more, this row or this row on the left, or are they the same if these were coins? Do they look about the same? They are. They are. <laughs> okay, I'll hold that up and talk. So they're the same, huh? Now watch this. Now which one has more? Watch up there. Watch this. Now, which row has more coins? This row or this row? Are they the same? That one. This one has more? No, the other one. This one has more. Ah, okay, even, in, even so, so this one has more or this one doesn't. Usually, oftentimes kids will say this one's spread out more so it has more. So it, he's beginning this idea of what Piaget called conservation. He probably won't catch it until around six, five and a half and it, sometimes even seven, e even this will take till about then before they figure that out. And so it's this idea that if things, if volume changes, or volume doesn't change, but let's say it's spread out more or turned this way, it will oftentimes show up as having more. And so um, it's the same thing with a piece of paper. Which one is taller, this one or this one, or are they the same? They look the second, the first. Yeah. Okay, he said the first. If we had these lined up, they look about the same now? Kinda, now watch. Is one, have, is one bigger or have more? That, the this one has more? One. Okay. So it's the same kind of thing you and I know, just because it simply moves, it doesn't change. So you, you, can, you, you can test this. You can also learn from it by splitting a Coke with the child and giving them a, you know, a real tall skinny glass and you take a big fat one for yourself. <laughs> Okay, let's try one more thing um, related to, uh, do we, d good, not so good, not ready. Kathy, you wanna come up and sit up for a minute? No, okay, no, you don't have to, you can sit there and watch. <laughs> okay, um, here's uh, the other thing that Piaget began to do. do you, uh, can I give you another question? All right, this one's related to some, some thinking like this in moral thinking. Let's, Andrew, here, here's what happened. One day, guess what? Where, where, where's, where's Judy? Oh, we'll start with Judy. <laughs> One day, Judy, you know what she did? Her mom told her, Judy, do not climb up on the counter and get the cookies, okay? That was her rule. Do you have any rules like that, what you're not supposed to do at the house? What are some of your rules? Mom never asked. She doesn't have any rules like that? Yeah. Yeah. No. Sounds like a good mom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A good deal. Well, you sound like a pretty easy kid. So guess what Judy did? Her mom told her, don't climb up on the counter. And you know what she did? She climbed up on the counter before dinner and she broke a glass. It fell over and broke. <laughs> Can you believe she did that? Oh, yeah. uh. <laughs> well, guess what Drew did one time? One time, Drew came running in the house and he was so excited and his mommy was carrying eight, eight glasses. She had them all on a tray and he ran in and he accidentally bumped into her and she knocked all eight of them over on accident and broke them. Oh. <laughs> Can you believe he did that? Who should be in more trouble? Drew, because it was an accident and he broke eight or Judy because she climbed up and broke one when she disobeyed her mommy, who should get in bigger trouble? Well, the bigger glass one. The bigger glass one. Yeah. Drew, you think he should get in trouble? Why should he get in trouble more? It's just because the cookies 
fell down the floor with the glass. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, that really wasn't part of the story. That, that, you just, that was just like a, an element that maybe you threw in there. But really, I didn't, that, see what happened is she just broke one glass, that's all, on ax, uh, when she climbed up there and disobeying, he broke eight on accident. So the bigger glasses should get in trouble, huh? By the way, moral development for a kid this age oftentimes revolves around outcomes, and that is eight classes, even if it was an accident. That will be morally, for them, they'll go, ooh, that should be bigger trouble. Does that make sense? One girl that disobeyed, oh, it's just one glass. And he'll pick this up as, we, we all know and recognize that. If kids were out playing, okay, ready? Have you ever, do you like to play sports, or do you play soccer, or baseball yet? No. Not yet. <laughs> you seem like a pretty smart kid, are you? You doing pretty good in school? And do you obey your parents pretty good? Do you watch TV somewhat? Yes. What's your favorite show on TV? Do you have a kid watch cartoons? Oh yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite cartoon? Mm -hmm. Veggie Tales. Oh yeah. Oh. <laughs> what else? Do you like Veggie Tales? Oh. Did you ever heard of that? I never. <laughs> no. <laughs> Probably pretty much say anything right now, and it'd be his favorite. Okay. Well, in in the capacity of this um, this knowledge of if kids were out running around playing and trampling something, let's say they're playing football and they tore up all the flower beds. A child like this would say, oftentimes, in, in this stage of morality, they would think to themselves, well, they should, ne they should get spankings and never play football again. That would be a fairly common thing, versus, oh, they should go out and just replant the flowers, right? Fix them up. And so, we won't go through that, but that's kind of some examples here. Do you have any questions, by the way, before I go on? Does, anything, does this make sense with, with uh, the way Piaget attempted to do this? Some of the stages of cognitive development? Any questions you have of Andrew? Or, yeah? Yeah, she asked about the question about the rouge test and the mirror. Um, yeah, it, it, it has, the question is, is you're, you're saying if they didn't have any exposure to the mirror until a certain time. Yeah, it's, for them, it's not a time thing necessarily as it is they believe it more of a developmental thing, a, a feature of the brain that simply begins to, to really understand something that I exist and this is just evidence of this reflection. Yeah, an older child almost immediately would go, that's that. Even if, even if they'd never seen a mirror before, now they would have to catch their reflection, but even, let's say a four-year-old that never seen a mirror before, they would catch it pretty quickly that that reflection is theirs. Yeah, it's a good, great, qu good question. You having fun so far? Yeah, should we see if there's any other questions? I'll see if there's any other questions. Anything else you have out there? Okay. Um, real quickly with Andrew, well, in fact, I'll tell you what, Andrew, you've been so good. Guess what? You finished. You did good up here. Oh. All right? Yeah. Anything you want to say? Anything, anything you want to say now as far as you want to sing a song or anything or tell people? Did you sing any songs? I love this face. He's like, <laughs> any songs you sing? You want to do a dance? No. No, <laughs> yes. no way. Whoa. <laughs> I've seen that before many times. <laughs> okay, Andrew. Well, I'll tell you what. Give me this thing. Give me your hand. Give me five. You did a good job. Come on down. Woo! All right. <laughs> um, there are some very fascinating things that, of course, occur. We're not going to be able to study all of them related to the next age group. I hope you caught a sense of what a preoperational child is like, the way Piaget and others attempt to go ahead as developmental psychologists to explore some of these cognitive changes in the brain. 
Um, there are huge changes that continue to occur throughout life. Let me just show you um, real fast what I want you to look at when it comes to adolescence and moral development. See uh, Lawrence Kohlberg. He's got uh, what's called this moral ladder, and that is how people develop and grow uh, morally. And I want you to, to, to pay attention to that. There are no questions on adulthood uh, out of the exam, and, or out of chapter four for the exam. And so you can uh, read up to and through adolescence and then begin to read uh, adulthood, but we just don't have time to cover it. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.